This screencast covers the topics Introduction to Cells and the Plasma Membrane. You will find this topic in Chapter 3 of your textbook. We will start by covering basic cell concepts. Here are your initial learning objectives. Explain how cells are the basic living units of the human body. Describe the three main parts of a cell. And lastly, describe extracellular materials. These include extracellular fluid, secretions, and the extracellular matrix. I thought I'd provide you with a little background on where the name cell actually comes from. Back in the mid 1600s, a lens grinder named Robert Hooke used one of his lenses to look at some cork. And what he found was similar to what you see here on the left. Cork, of course, is what remains of dead plants. And what he saw were the uh, outlines of those plant cells, the plant cell walls. And he thought that what he uh, was viewing looked like the living quarters of monks in a monastery, which uh, were called cellulae. And so that's where the name cells comes from. And uh, cytology, of course, is the scientific study of cells. I'm sure you noticed that the name of this chapter uh, is cells, the living units. Well, what makes cells the living components of the human body? The human body is composed, of course, somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion cells and substances produced by those cells. So in other words, the, the living body is cells and substances produced by those cells. And as far as we know, all living organisms, humans included, consist of one or more cells. Life does not exist without at least one cell. The cells of the human body are responsible for carrying out all of the life-sustaining functions and processes required to maintain the human organism. This may sound strange, but at one time there was this belief in what's called spontaneous generation, that living organisms were generated from non-living substances, which of course was proven to be incorrect by Louis Pasteur. We now know that cells arise from other cells and not from non-living materials. There are about 200 types of different cells in the human body. So there is this enormous diversity of cells in terms of their uh, anatomy, which of course then reflects their physiology and this is these are just some illustrations here here we have fibroblasts that are responsible for the production of dense connective tissue they lay down a lot of collagen fibers you have erythrocytes what you know is red blood cells which are literally little wafers can uh, completely filled to the brim with hemoglobin for carrying oxygen you have fat cells that have mainly one function, which is to store fat. Uh, you have uh, these macrophages, which wander around the body, finding uh, microorganisms, foreign microorganisms that somehow have made it into the human body and they surround them and, uh, and destroy them. You have nerve cells, which generate nerve impulses leading to the release of neurotransmitters. And then you have a gamete here or sex cell with this long flagella that uh, swims in search of an ovum to fertilize. So you have this en enormous diversity of cells in the human body in terms of anatomy, which of course reflects the diversity of physiology or function of these cells. 
Despite the huge diversity in terms of anatomy and physiology among cells, most cells do have the same basic parts. And so you're going to be studying the generalized or composite cell. Every cell will not look necessarily like the illustrations that uh, you will be seeing, but every cell more or less will have the same basic parts and features. All human cells have three main parts, but they include the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus. This image comes from your book. Here we have a cell where we've taken a transverse cut or section to reveal the in internal components of the cell. The plasma membrane, one of the main parts of the cell, separates the extracellular from the intracellular. Basically, everything within the boundaries of the plasma membrane is intracellular. Everything outside the boundaries of the plasma membrane is extracellular. Inside the cell, typically toward the center, but not always, is a spheroidal structure called the nucleus. The nucleus is referred to as the control center of the cell because that's what where the DNA is found and the DNA of course uh, determines all the proteins that the cell makes and cells are basically protein factories. Therefore the nucleus is the control center for that protein factory. The area within the boundaries of the plasma membrane excluding the nucleus is considered the cytoplasm. So all of this is the region called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm contains this semi-solid fluid called cytosol. So don't mix up cytoplasm with cytosol. The cytoplasm is the region. The cytosol is this semi-solid fluid within that region. So I like to use this analogy. Think of the cytoplasm as a pool and the cytosol would be the water in the pool. Embedded in this semi-solid fluid are the little organs or, or organelles that are responsible for carrying out all the metabolic functions of the cell. Organelles include um, structures such as the mitochondria, centrioles, Golgi apparatus, etc. So those are the three main parts of the cell, plasma membrane, nucleus, cytoplasm. Before we move on to discuss the cell proper, I do want to take a moment to mention that extracellular material. So we said that extracellular material are all the substances that are found outside the cell that include extracellular fluid like lymph, cerebral spinal fluid, interstitial fluid. You also have secretions of cells such as hormones and other substances that the cell secretes. And lastly, you have the extra cellular matrix. The extracellular matrix provides a scaffold which binds cells in a tissue together. They consist mainly of proteins and polysaccharides. We are looking at a microscopic slide of areolar tissue to illustrate the extracellular matrix. Areolar tissue, by the way, is the most abundant tissue in the human body. So you'll see these little round structures here. These are the cells of areolar tissue. Everything outside of these cells is extracellular and mainly extracellular matrix. In this illustration, the extracellular matrix consists of collagen fibers. Collagen is a protein and elastic fibers. And again, uh, el elastin is a protein, so we've got these protein fibers in the extracellular matrix. And although you can't really see it here, you've got polysaccharides out here in the extracellular matrix as well. Some tissues have lots of extracellular matrix, such as the areolar tissue, where the cells are uh, are very sparse and spread apart. And then you have other tissues like epithelial tissue uh, you'll learn about later where this, there's not a lot of extracellular matrix because the uh, cells are packed tightly together. 
Now we're going to focus on the plasma membrane. Your learning objectives are as follows. Describe in detail the composition and structure of the plasma membrane. Describe the function of cholesterol in the plasma membrane. Define glycolipids and glycoproteins. And lastly, differentiate between peripheral proteins and transmembrane proteins. Let's start by looking at the functions of the plasma membrane. So here is a image of the plasma membrane. Notice the plasma membrane separates the cytoplasm from the extracellular fluid. And this is a similar figure to one you'll find in your textbook. The plasma membrane, of course, is a physical barrier between what is extracellular and what is intracellular. The plasma membrane controls the interactions of one cell with the extracellular fluid. The plasma membrane is what is called selectively permeable. It allows some substances to cross easily and other cells not so much. And it can pick and choose what crosses the plasma membrane into the cell or out of the cell at any given time. The uh, plasma membrane has structures that interact with the extracellular fluid or other nearby cells. And so the plasma membrane plays a critical role in the way cells communicate with one another and how they interact with one another as well. Notice that the plasma membrane has two faces. It has an intracellular face, that's the surface that faces the cytoplasm, and it has an extracellular face, that's the surface that faces the extracellular fluid. Further, the plasma membrane needs to be flexible yet sturdy, and this is facilitated by the presence of lipids. 98% of the molecules in the plasma membrane are lipids. So everything that you see here in yellow and even the blue structures are lipids. And then embedded in the, that lipid are proteins, which you see here in purple. Some of those proteins are anchored to the cytoskeleton, and others are able to sort of float around. Now let's look more closely at the constituents of the plasma membrane. Let's focus first on the lipids. Looking at the plasma membrane, notice that we have two layers of phospholipids. And notice they are arranged with the polar heads, forming the surfaces, the extracellular face and the intracellular face of the plasma membrane, and the nonpolar tails making up the center. Some of those 
phospholipids have a carbohydrate component attached to them, making them glycolipids, a lipid with a carbohydrate moiety or component attached. Also dispersed throughout the plasma membrane is cholesterol. Remember, cholesterol is a steroid, so it's a lipid as well. Let's look at the functions of these lipids in the plasma membrane. As I am sure you noticed, by far the most abundant component of the plasma membrane are the phospholipids, making up about 75% of the molecules found in the plasma membrane. If you remember, the plasma membrane, can, excuse me, phospholipids consists of a phosphate attached to a glycerol. And remember, the phosphate is polar, hydrophilic, attracted to water. And then on the other end of the molecule, we have these fatty acids, which are composed mainly of hydrocarbons, nonpolar bonds, making them nonpolar and hydrophobic, water-fearing. And in shorthand, we draw a phospholipid like this with the polar, polar hydrophilic head represented like this, and the two hydrophobic nonpolar tails illustrated as such. The plasma membrane consists of a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of phospholipids where the heads are arranged to face the intracellular and extracellular fluid, and the core of the plasma membrane is composed of those hydrophobic tails. It makes sense for the phospholipids to orient themselves this way because the polar heads, of course, are going to be attracted to the water of the extracellular matrix, excuse me, extracellular fluid, which is mainly water and the cytosol of the cytoplasm, which again is mainly water. Amphiphilic refers to the fact that one end of the molecule is uh, charged and the other end of the molecule is nonpolar. This is going to become important later on when we look at how substances cross the plasma membrane, because what you're going to find is substances that are nonpolar, like the hydrophobic interior of the plasma membrane, tend to easily cross the plasma membrane, many times by simple diffusion. Other substances that are charged and hydrophilic, unlike the core, of the plasma membrane, they require special channels or carrier molecules to bring them across. But we'll talk more about that in a later screencast. Well, what about those cholesterol molecules, which make up the other 20% of the lipids found in the plasma membrane? Well, they play a very important role in stabilizing the plasma membrane as temperature changes. So phospholipids are lipids, and they are sensitive to temperature. So as temperature changes ever so slightly, hopefully, in the human body, cholesterol helps maintain the normal fluidity 
of the plasma membrane. As temperature increases and these phospholipids would tend to move further apart, the cholesterol molecules helps keep them together. As temperature decreases and the phospholipid molecules move closer together, these cholesterol molecules help uh, maintain some distance between them. So cholesterol in the plasma membrane helps stabilize or provide stability as temperatures change. As was mentioned before, attached to some of these phospholipids is a carbohydrate component. And these phospholipids therefore are, some of them are glycolipids. These carbohydrate components shown here on green are only found on the external face or surface of the plasma membrane. And if you look across the external face or surface, you'll see that they form a sugary coating on the external surface of the cell. Now that we've discussed the lipid components of the plasma membrane, let's now talk about the other 2% of the molecules present in the plasma membrane, which of course are the proteins shown here in purple. Even though proteins by numbers only represent 2% of the molecules found in the plasma membrane, because they are much more dense than lipids, they actually account for 50% of the weight of the plasma membrane. Notice that some of the proteins uh, span the entire width of the plasma membrane and others are only found on one surface or the other. Proteins that are only found on one face of the plasma membrane or the other are called peripheral proteins. Think peripheral periphery. They are often tethered to the cytoskeleton on the intracellular face and support the plasma membrane. They also aid in the movement of cells and its organelles as well as other materials within the cell. Other proteins called transmembrane proteins extend completely through the plasma membrane from one face to the other. Trans means to extend or cross to the other side, thus the name. Most of these transmembrane proteins are glycoproteins containing a carbohydrate moiety. Some are anchored to the cytoskeleton. Others can sort of float freely within the phospholipid bilayer. You may have heard the plasma membrane referred to as a fluid mosaic model. A mosaic is a pattern uh, typically composed of small colored objects. These objects can be metal or glass or rocks. My understanding is uh, these were popular back in uh, ancient times. Fluid refers to something that changes over time. And so the plasma membrane is often referred to as a fluid fluid mosaic model, because you can imagine uh, over time some of these proteins that are allowed to sort of float around. If you were to look down onto the external or extracellular face of the plasma membrane, you would see this pattern where these proteins are embedded in the plasma membrane, but over time it changes. So you'd have like a mosaic that over time changes, thus the term fluid mosaic model. Let's now review the objectives of the screencast. We started with basic cell concepts, explain how cells are the basic living units of the human body, describe the three main parts of the cell, and describe extracellular materials 
including extracellular fluid, secretions, and the extracellular matrix. We then went on to focus on the plasma membrane. Learning objectives were describe in detail the composition and structure of the plasma membrane, describe the function of cholesterol in the plasma membrane, define glycolipids and glycoproteins, and finally, differentiate between peripheral proteins and transmembrane proteins.